by the way, it's on its forum, BX257, your friendly neighborhood 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe toy reviewer. And for this New Year special, I'm going to be revealing my personal top 10 favorite G.I. Joe and Cobra action figures. Now, many years ago, I actually did do a top 10, but those consisted of five Joes and five Cobras. And this time, I'm going to be doing a proper 10 Joes and 10 Cobras as a single list. So while some of you who might remember that old video might not be surprised by my uh, top five picks for either side, you should be surprised by the entire list. So say goodbye to 2017 and say hello to 2018. Let's start off with some honorable mentions. To be honest, these are figures that were part of my top 10 until being bumped down by more recent finds. On the bad guy side, we have a 1984 Zartan. He's one of the more memorable toys that I never had as a child. As a kid, the toy's real ability to turn green in the sunlight was almost magical and something I can still appreciate well into adulthood. I remember being on the playground of school the summer of 84 and some lucky kid brought him in to show everyone the feature. The commercial jingle for both his toy and the comic he first appeared in has still always stuck with me too. On the good guy side, I nominate the 1986 mail away version of Sergeant Slaughter. I was never into wrestling, but this loud brash drills instructor really struck a chord with me. I always thought the Joes needed a tough Sarge in their ranks, and the principle of pain fits that bill. It also helps that the figure is taller than most other Joes, so he looks perfectly intimidating, even next to other hardcore Joes like Gung Ho and Roadblock. While I didn't get him during my childhood, I stopped buying toys in 85. I still had the pleasure of receiving him as a mail away in 1994 when I returned to collecting. Canada still had a large overstock of mail away toys that wouldn't be depleted until the following year. In 10th place on my list for the bad guy side, we have the 1988 Destro version 2. And honestly, the version I think has the coolest design. The cape, sword, and shoulder spikes really shouts leader, and the gold chrome head gives him a futuristic appeal. I still believe that the whole Iron Grenadiers vs. Battle Force 2000 thing was originally an attempt to set the G.I. Joe universe in the future. Whatever the actual deal is, the whole Iron Grenadier faction really appeals to me. Kind of the opposite of the Dreadnoughts. So this version of Destro is always front and center whenever I display them. He would rank much higher on the list, but I think you'll see why he's all the way down here as I get through the video. On the Joe's side, we have a relative newcomer, the 1990 Sky Patrol Airborne. Borrowed code name aside, I love his looks with an almost firefly urban gray camo with just the right amount of silver and red trim. He's a borrowed body mold from the 1986 lift ticket, which wasn't bad in its original color scheme, but this is a great update. Add to that the simplicity of accessories, helmet, battle rifle, and backpack make him an uncomplicated action soldier toy. Having a big silver parachute, which is standard to all his Sky Patrol comrades, isn't that bad either. The color actually complements this figure. Ninth on my list is the 1986 Bats. These robots are well designed and engineered, like two great tastes that taste great together. The black color scheme with pops of yellow and silver is eye-catching, and the mechanical detail, especially the lenticular chest sticker, is very cool. Then there's the engineering involved in giving an action figure of this size a removable hand with three more interchangeable weapon hands and storage for them. Brilliant! To me, they provide an opportunity to show the Joes blasting a Cobra soldier to bits. Not so gruesome when those bits are bolts. In ninth place for the Joe side is another relative newcomer to my toy box, Big Ben. A figure I included in my 8th vlog featuring awesome G.I. Joes from the 1990s, but have yet to do a full video review for. I still can't believe this guy was made in 1991. His design and color scheme scream serious combat soldier. It's almost comical putting him side by side with that year's Snake Eyes. Something I didn't cover in the vlog, which I really appreciate about the figure, is that the amount of accessories isn't overwhelming, and he doesn't come with an oversized spring-loaded gimmick. Eighth on the Cobra side is a 1988 Astro Viper. I know you may be thinking that G.I. Joe has no business in outer space, and I can appreciate that opinion. But Hasbro always sold the idea realistically, mentioning the vulnerability of satellites for communication, GPS, and espionage. The Astro Viper borrows the Strato Viper color scheme of red, silver, and gray, adds in a cool helmet, and tops it off with a combination jetpack double laser cannon. His color scheme also blends in with Cobra's first spacecraft, the Stellar Stiletto, adding a sense of fleet cohesion to this division. 
For 8th place on the Joe side is the 1987 Outback. In some ways, this guy really makes me feel my age. He reminds me of the 1970s G.I. Joe Adventure Team. Remember when Joe wasn't about combat but exploring, rescuing, and testing one's limits? Outback remembers. This guy perfectly sums up being a wandering adventurer with a giant backpack full of survival goodies and a flashlight. But let's face it, that giant gun isn't there to keep the bears away. I've placed him in drill sergeant displays just as many times as I've happily put him in a canoe and left him out away from my toy displays depicting battles. In 7th place is the 1989 Night Viper. 1989 was the year Hasbro was getting back on track with proper military specialties for Cobra, and the Night Viper was the top figure for that year. It's not hard to see why. With so many things they could have done wrong, he's an excellent sculpt and excellent color scheme. Granted, the dark green and black gives him more of a practical Joe feeling, but the sculpt and details are more than Cobra enough. A detachable visor-mounted night scope and rifle that pegs onto his thigh, plus IR green-colored Cobra symbol and division patch, equals badass. Placing 7th on the Joe side is the 1989 Stalker version 2. Speaking of the canoe from the Outback entry, this is where it comes from. He is without a doubt the most versatile figure ever produced for the basic carded line. The canoe disassembles and can be attached to his back, and everything, the outrigger parts, knife, cannon, gun, and mask can be stored inside. Don't feel like using a canoe that really floats on water? Give it to Outback and Stalker still doesn't look like he's missing anything. I've always liked the Stalker character from the old Marvel comics, but this outfit reminds me of his best appearances later in the run. In 6th place is the 1984 Mail-Away Hooded Cobra Commander. Like the Sergeant Slaughter on this list, I didn't get this figure during my childhood, but did catch the 1994 Mail-Away Canadian Overstock Godsend. I had always wanted this version for his richer, more commanding dark blue and gold color scheme over the light blue of the previous Cobra Commander. Yes, the hooded head sculpt hasn't aged very well, looking more like Inky the Ghost from Pac-Man, but at least he matches the shade of blue shared with other Cobra figures and vehicles. At 6th place is the 1983 Duke. That's right, I said 1983 and not 1984. Okay, okay, there's no real physical difference, except to me. You see, unlike Sergeant Slaughter and the Hooded Cobra Commander, I actually did mail order this guy back in my childhood. I may not have been as attached to him as being leader of my Joes, being a newcomer toy and not seeing his role in Mass Device miniseries on TV yet. Still, it was a real fun experience opening that little brown box and pulling out a cool looking action figure your friends probably didn't have. Unless they waited a year. Darn you Hasbro. I'm pretty sure the Canadian version I received didn't have a country flag sticker, but his helmet ear holes were sealed up, which I remember being perplexed by seeing as I had several 82 Joe helmets that did have those holes. At the halfway mark of 5th place on the Cobra side is the original 1984 Storm Shadow. This is a well done figure and a perfect representation of what I think a traditional ninja should look like. There's nothing cartoony about the sculpt. It's overall very subtle with details in natural spots. His accessories aren't modern, but are the most finely crafted things I've ever seen. The opening bow quiver stores two swords and his bow, and it all attaches to his back on a slant, making sure you see his sword handles ready to be grabbed over his shoulder. I'm old fashioned, so when I think of ninjas, I think thieves and assassins. Bad guys. Sure, there are more Joe versions of Stormy than Cobra versions, but I actually like him as an opposite number to Snake Eyes. Also joining the halfway mark at 5th place is Snake Eyes, of course. It just wouldn't be a top 10 G.I. Joe list without this guy somewhere on it. Despite growing up with the 1982 first version, my choice is the 1985 version 2. There's just something perfect about this update. It's the medieval night visor, the completely dark color scheme on a good guy, the pet wolf, the lips, all I can say is it's probably all of the above. It's his iconic look that many love and associate not only his character with, but the entire G.I. Joe franchise. You'd think with all this praise I'm giving this toy, he'd be higher on the list. Sure, his cool factor is way above average, but he was also a figure I didn't get until adulthood, so he's missing a bit of that nostalgia factor for me. At 4th place is the 1985 Snow Serpent. Winter Ops is my favorite environment, and what better first Arctic themed Cobra soldier than one that is just loaded with accessories? You wouldn't start to get Cobra figures with a heavy loadout as standard until 4 years later. Standard things like a backpack, snowshoes, and a battle rifle, sure, 
but the addition of the separate parachute pack and standalone rocket is just amazing. His sculpt is pretty bold too, bulky to give a sense of thick clothing, but not too blocky as to hinder posing. Their black hockey goalie mask is non-traditional, but pretty interesting and a bit spooky. This is the only Cobra I've purposely army built. That should say a lot by itself. To complement the 4th place Snow Serpent is a 1983 Snow Job. He was a childhood toy which I got during Christmas of 83 along with the Polar Battle Bear Ski Mobile. This guy got a lot of use outdoors in the cold and was the most poseable Arctic soldier I had. Well, seeing as the others were 4 point of articulation Star Wars Snow Troopers. This was also the first figure to come with storage options for his accessories and the only G.I. Joe Ski Patroller to come with ski poles. During the Christmas season, he often finds his way apart from my toy displays. My kids have nicknamed him Yukon Cornelius. Maybe this year I should swap the rifle for Alpine's pickaxe. In third place is the 1985 Crimson Guard. Red might be a bit bright for combat, but in reality, it's a color that often represents the military elite. As a child, these guys' bio really made me think. They're smart, upperly mobile businessmen and politicians when they're not saluting Cobra Commander. The whole 80s me generation of becoming lawyers or bankers just seemed a little sinister because of Larry Hama's file card, but I think that was the point. A person wearing a suit and tie doesn't automatically make them honorable, and this is where I learned that valuable lesson. The sculpt of the figure was also pretty cool, being very parade formal, long before we get a Joe in similar gear. All that silver detail, if it hasn't rubbed away over time, is a pleasure to look at too. For the Joe side in third place is a 1984 Roadblock. For me, the character is the epitome of being tough but friendly. His rhyming speech in the cartoon was the coolest thing ever and made him very memorable to me. His appearances in the comics were also numerous, although oddly sporting this version of his outfit even during times when he should have been wearing the updated ones. His figure tries hard to get the impression of a large muscular body, only failing due to the constraints of the initial figure buck sculpt dimensions of the time. Still, the toy looks good and accessories are pretty cool too. The tripod attaching to the backpack just emphasizes that the character doesn't need that in order to hold up his giant heavy machine gun. In second place is a lone female on my list, the 1984 Baroness. Introduced as the number two in Cobra Command, she was never intended to be an action figure. The Baroness was born from the comics and always given me the impression of a deadly and capable enemy agent, but her original outfit wasn't very inspired. Two years after her introduction, and the action figure finally got green lit and sported a distinctive all-black, form-fitting leather dominatrix-inspired outfit that the designers clearly pushed the envelope with. I won't lie and say I didn't appreciate the fan service back then, or even now. I do remember looking for this figure back in 1984 and not finding it, unlike a lot of other ladies in toy lines aimed at boys. Apparently, I wasn't the only one who liked bad girls. In second place is yet another Joe named Airborne, although this one is from 1983 and has no relation to the one from 1990. A childhood toy, this guy got a lot of use due to his generic infantryman nature. His pale but subdued outfit meant that he could be played with in a variety of environments, and his parachute and goggle adorned helmet accessories pretty much guaranteed his co-pilot status in my all-time favorite Joe vehicle, the Sky Striker. The fixed bayonet on his rifle was also pretty unique and intimidating back then. His darker skin tone also had a lot of school friends saying that he looked like me, which is pretty flattering. Today, I display him as the leader of my small group of Steel Brigade figures, which have a similar color scheme and accessory set. First place will probably not come as a surprise to many longtime viewers, as I'm often asked who is my favorite bad guy. It's the 1983 Destro. He was a childhood toy and acted as leader of my Cobra forces as I didn't get a Cobra Commander figure until much later, and even then I treated their relationship like that of Darth Vader and the Emperor. Destro is just an amazing sculpt featuring imposing size, sharp edged chrome head, and armored gloves with little rockets on one of them. Sure, it's all detail and not removable accessories, but it really inspired me to treat him like the most dangerous character I ever owned. All that, and he was still suave enough to steal the Baroness's heart. And finally, my all-time favorite Joe, the 1983 Flash. Maybe he's not a memorable Joe to most, but the figure holds a special place in my heart. While I did get some 82 Joes for my birthday and Christmas as gifts, 
Flash was the first Joe I ever bought with my own money. At the beginning of 1983, all the 1982 figures were re-released with Civil War and Battle Grip. The money I earned from doing chores and primarily spent on junk food and comics would go towards something I generally waited patiently for someone else to give to me. I still remember the Kmart location I frequented having a display of these newly re-released figures near the checkouts. What attracted me to Flash above the others? It was a combination of the attention-grabbing brick orange pads on his otherwise very military olive green, the large amount of accessories, and the fact that he was a laser trooper. Remember, sci-fi toys are still tops back then, so having a super articulated army man that could still hang with Luke Skywalker meant that I could, and would, make tons of fond memories playing with him. It was pretty hard coming up with just 10 since there are tons that just narrowly miss the list. So who is on your top 10? Leave a comment or a link to a video showing your picks. Have a happy new year and yo Joe!